Hello, welcome to Talks at Brickstone, your one-stop podcast for research, insights, and interviews on thought leadership issues relating to Africa's infrastructure, built environment, and natural environment. I'm your host, Femi Aufala. Today's episode is in two parts, A and B. You are about to listen to part B. If you haven't listened to part A, kindly go back listen and return. So, more now into the lenders or let me say the financiers. Um, so, you have mentioned that you know, a ship could be financed self by itself or you could finance it through um, your, your lenders or investors or financiers or you could also finance it through like the supplier's credit thing because it's also a form of finance in a way but typically um, Nigerian banks in the past have been known to finance vessels um, we don't see a number of offshore um, jack-up weeds or, or seagoing vessels that were financed um, in the 2010 between 2009 and 2012 um, some of them have been in, indebted. Maybe they've not been able to. The sponsors have not been able to, you know, meet the obligations that are twenty in terms of debt service. For these lenders, I mean, what are their what first of all, what should they be looking out for, and what are their fallback options? You know, in terms of, um, I'm a bank. I'm not interested in shipping, but you know, I have to see this guy ship. He has refused to pay. But being a lawyer and a commercial person. Um, what kind of resolution mechanisms are basically available to, to get the ship back to work or to bring in a third party operator, you know, to get a contract and things? I mean, what, what do you think? I, I think for me personally, um, having done work for banks as well as um, ship owners, shipping transcends just the assets, which is a mistake. Uh, I would say mistake is the perspective that most banks look at from a credit perspective. For when they actually are setting and designing the credit to lend, um, the vessel is only as good as its managers. If you don't, so you need to have identify the borrower, what's the borrower's uh, business plan, okay. Okay. what is their maintenance program, okay. what is their staff welfare program. These things are very important. For instance, you need to find out what kind of business will this vessel be used for? What's the market outlay? Is it a saturated market? Or what gives you a better uh, edge above everybody else? What plans do you have for insurance? What kind of PI club are you looking at? Ultimately, Who's going to manage the vessel? Is it going to be managed? Are you going to hire your own crew directly or are you going to have a ship manager outsourced to deal with this? If it's a ship manager, what's the ship manager's reputation in the industry? And more importantly, how do you take care of the crew? Um, the crew are the ones on board the vessel. If they're not happy, they can also just pour salt in the engine and that's the end of it. <laughs> so you need to have all this things in perspective. And maintenance is also, as a Nigerian point of view, you need to also have a proper maintenance program. There's what they call dry dock, which is every five years. Okay. They're not cheap. So what plans will that person have in place for that vessel? And what amount of money are they going to be putting aside to actually fund that pro- that uh, program, that the dry docking program? That aside, the typical thing a lender looks at is the amount you want it for, what you want to do for. If you want to, if you are taking the new vessel for the technology you finance, either you want to use to acquire a vessel or you want to use this as collateral for something you want to invest in. But for most of this, I just limit it to just vessel acquisition. You need to look at the, or at the bank, you need to look at the underlying uh, MOA, MOA okay. acquisition. Because what we've seen in experience is that I go and identify a vessel I want to buy say five million dollars. Ten percent is required to put as deposit. Correct. I put the deposit down. 
or I commit to put the deposit down, say within four days. Okay. Have I spoken to my bank to find out that the money is to be transferred to a bank in China? How long does it take my bank to transfer money to China? It will take seven, three days. I tell my client we have to fight for seven days. You need to have a buffer because once you miss that agreed timeline, and penalty. it becomes a breach. Okay. If the seller doesn't want to amend because parties can agree and amend their agreement and say, okay, we extend the timeline. So it's things like this that we've seen instances whereby um, the bank needs to be carried along in every vessel acquisition negotiation. You can negotiate your own way and do it conditionally subject to verification for things like board approval and my bank to review it. You need to have the bank, bank needs to look at it, bank needs to look at what insurance programs for the vessel. They need to identify the eligibility and see what the next of the vessel. So that's inspection that was mentioned earlier on. They look at inspection report, verify it, and they're happy with the state of the vessel. They're happy with what you plan. So if you're importing a new vessel, do you have funds for paying for import duty? It's a huge sum of money. You probably know what it is. It could be between 20% to 25% of the purchase price. So it's a huge cost. And all the more importantly, what is the tenor? Nigerian banks have been known to give short term tenors for financing. It's, in my opinion, um, it's not sustainable because internationally, with the big shipping companies, countries around the world, typical tenors for second hand vessels run for four to ten years and up to twelve years for new build. So, if you're doing a three year, five year financing for a new build for second hand vessel, that's a facility you are looking to restructure exactly. or it's going to default down the road. That's true. That's so true. we need to be mindful of this. But I also understand the banks are constrained by the CDM requirements for what they can do. Mm-hmm. But um, the master, as I understand, has also picked up on this and they're currently speaking to the central bank to try and get banks to make available simple digital dollar financing. Because internationally, that is what the people here are competing with. Yeah. They're yeah. getting single digits. Yeah. So any country that wants to develop shipping must have a constructive shipping policy such as this, the CBN must also allow banks to give up to at least 7, 10 years to come. The amount, um, NCDMB, because of things, because of that, the usual argument of the banks was always that the underlying contract by the IOCs was 2-3 years. So okay. Local Content Board has now started ensuring that 5-7 to seven year tenor contracts are being given so that it can match the underlying, underlying funding, funding of yourself. Correct. Thank you so much for this. Um, now, apart from lenders, I mean, we always talk about this private market of private equity and um, also having private investors. Um, in what ways could, could non-financial or non-bank financial institutions take part in the in the shipping market, especially from the supplier credit you mentioned? Or because I've, I've found cases where a supplier credit is issued and we. And on the back of that, a bond is also issued because as the lender repays, you know, sorry, as the ship buyer repays the supplier credit um, issuer, so to say, um, they, they can transfer that money also into a bond program where the coupon payment now becomes the source of um, income for the for the bondholders. So I just wanted to know, are there any ways where you know, the private market could play in, in ship finance? Well, um, the last couple of years internationally, we've had a lot of private equity going to shipping because traditional banks, German banks, uh, were all scaling back and pulling out from shipping. They were all burnt. Um, there's still growth, speaking from the Nigerian perspective. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity in the what we call the oil and gas sector. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, um, oil and gas sector is heavily dependent on shipping. The rigs, the vessels you use are all vessels, our ships. Now, the local content board has taken both by the one and created an enabling environment for contracts to be given out to Nigerian uh, companies on the back of the local content act. Okay. The local content act itself recognizes the Cabotage Act, which limits 
um, trade within Nigerian waters, which happens to be where the oil and gas assets are, Correct. Um, to only Nigerian owned vessels, Nigerian built vessels, Nigerian crude vessels, and the four heads are forgotten the fourth one. But more importantly, private equity, in my opinion, can actually set up vehicles, okay, acquire these assets, and act as these companies. Okay. Because everybody may not necessarily want to buy. That's true. So, just like the airlines, airlines sector. Yeah. So, if they're able to set up vehicles to acquire vessels and then lease them, so but that means they have to identify the off-takers and what they require, and not just buy vessels that are not required. Yeah. yeah. And it also funds directly. It's uh, to oil and gas companies that require vessels. Hello. If you've watched this far, I believe you find this podcast interesting. You can listen to the rest of the podcast via the link below or check out our website on www.brickstone.africa forward slash podcast. Thank you.